Today, we're headed to a British museum made famous by an eccentric guy who liked to travel the town in a carriage pulled by zebras. A museum that is home to dodo bird replicas and odd toad ungulates and bird skins. A museum that was caught entirely unawares when a robber with deft fingers made off with a bag full of those bird skins valued at millions of dollars. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Let's take a field trip to the Natural History Museum at Tring, about an hour away from London. This museum opened to the public in 1892 because pretty much everything in England is old. And I'm guessing that some of you are going to say, oh, that's not very old because it's England and so everything's even older than that. Anyway, this museum started as the private collection of Walter Rothschild, a British banker, politician, zoologist, and soldier who is actually the right honorable, the Lord Rothschild to you. Thank you very much. Walter was a big animal guy to the point of, yeah, riding around England in zebra-drawn carriages. He actually bred animals, too, including horse-zebra hybrids, which are called zebroids, if you didn't know. The museum is a brick Tudor-style building that looks more like Walter's mansion, but it's his then-collection, now-museum, and it has six galleries, each one of which houses a different set of animals. Primates, kangaroos, hippopotamuses, snakes, domestic animals, crocodilians, and more. But today, we focus on parts of the museum that aren't public, specifically the birds. During World War II, a staggering collection of bird skins were collected by famed naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, and they were moved to the museum to protect them from the bombing of London. Because of this collection and others, the museum boasts one of the largest collections of extinct and endangered bird skins in the entire world. The main character of today's story, Edwin Rist, on the other hand, was not a bird guy, at least at first. He was a flute guy. Born in 1989 in New York City, Edwin was homeschooled. At a fairly young age, the family, including a younger brother, moved to the Hudson Valley area, where Edwin was a promising young musician. His parents are both journalists, and when Edwin was 10, his dad was researching for a story about the physics of fly casting. Because of this, Edwin happened to watch a video about fly tying. I learned a lot about fly tying for this episode. Anyway, fly tying is the art and craft of creating artificial fishing flies. These flies are designed to imitate the appearance of various insects, bait fish, or other prey that fish commonly feed on. Fly tying involves using a variety of materials such as feathers, fur, threads, or like synthetic materials to construct a fly that mimics the characteristics of natural prey. Fly tying is not only a practical skill for fishers, but is also considered an art form by many. And Edwin was all in. He was mesmerized by seeing the ordinary turn extraordinary. He became obsessed with the craft, and especially with salmon flies. Designs for salmon flies date back over a hundred years, and the recipes, they call them recipes, which are actually just the designs, require feathers from birds all over the world. Edwin actually got very, very good at making flies, and before long was going to fly tying competitions and winning them. He became something of a prodigy in fly tying, and not just because he was so young in his mid-teens at this point. He was just really, really good at it. But as good as he got, and how embraced he was by the community, he didn't have enough real money to buy the feathers that he wanted. You see, these recipes for salmon flies called for exotic or rare birds that were often endangered and protected. It was difficult and really expensive for Edwin to get the feathers he needed for the best and most authentic salmon flies. By this point, Edwin wasn't just a talented fly tire. Edwin was also an incredibly talented flautist. When he was 20 years old, he was selected to attend the British Royal Academy of Music in London, one of the oldest music schools in the United Kingdom. It boasts alumni such as 
Annie Lennox, and Sir Elton John himself. Edwin, who loved feathers and flutes, decided to put his feathers aside and focus on his dream of playing in the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. He didn't even bring his fly-tying tools on the plane for fear that TSA wouldn't take a liking to them. He was, he was probably right. He was probably right on that account. Edwin started his studies at the academy, but it wasn't long before he heard about the Natural History Museum at Ting and the museum's collection of rare birds from, well, he heard about it from a fly-tying friend he'd made in Canada. I don't know if anyone's ever said that sentence, ever. Anyway, the specimens were tucked away in non-public parts of the museum. The only way to even see these rare specimens is to have a legitimate academic reason. So when Edwin emailed the museum, yeah, he emailed the museum, he did not tell them he was a flute student, but instead he said he needed to photograph the birds for a friend's PhD thesis. He brought a camera, signed into the visitor's log using his real name, and was shown to a back room where the birds, many still tagged with the collection tags filled out by the famous naturalist Alfred himself. The specimens are referred to as bird skins. That's why I've been calling them bird skins. It's kind of gross, but it is what it is. And in honor of these bird skins, we're going to make one of the most famous bird-themed cocktails. It might be the only one. Well, Anyway, it's the Jungle Bird. It was born in the early 1970s at the height of tiki mania and the resurgence of tropical drinks. The cocktail was invented by beverage manager Jeffrey Ong. Jeffrey oversaw the aviary bar at the Hilton Kuala Lumpur, which opened in 1973. He set out to create a welcome cocktail that would transport guests to the jungle while satisfying their thirst, drawing inspiration from the colorful birds visible from the bar's viewing area. To mix up your own jungle bird, take one and a half parts rum, three quarter parts of a bitter red liqueur, one and a half parts pineapple juice, and a half part lime juice, oh, and a half part simple syrup, and add to an ice-filled shaker. Shake until everything is well combined and chilled, and then strain into a glass with fresh ice. Add a cherry and a pineapple slice for a tropical garnish. To make the mocktail, take one and a half parts rum syrup, three quarters parts cherry juice, tart cherry juice if you can find it, but it doesn't have to be, one and a half parts pineapple juice, a half part lime juice, and a simple syrup to taste, and add that to an ice-filled shaker. Shake and strain over fresh ice. And the mocktail also needs that pineapple and cherry garnish. When Edwin stepped into the back room and was allowed to open the first filing cabinet, he was blown away by what he saw. He would say, quote, for a fly tire, for someone who understands the feathers and sees the potential in them and who really has a passion, that overwhelming, wow, what have I just seen feeling was all that I had. And I remember it to this point because it was just so extraordinary, end quote. And it seems like, though he has said differently, he pretty much decided at that very moment that he was about to steal himself some birds. <laughs> Edwin photographed and cataloged where each type of specimen was kept inside the giant file cabinets. He also, he took pictures of areas around the museum. He made notes of the facility's security and headed back to London, where he created a Word document on his computer, which he titled, Plan for Museum Invasion. <laughs> He made a list of things he would need, including a glass cutter and a ton of Ziploc bags to use for all the feathers he would eventually pluck. After a flute performance on the night of June 23, 2009, Edwin took the 45-minute train ride to Tring. He brought a wheeled suitcase, some latex gloves, some wire cutters, an LED at light, and that trusty glass cutter. He popped into an alley behind the museum and used the wire cutters to cut off the triple branded barbed wire on top of the security fence. Once he had enough space clear, he shimmied up the seven foot fence with help from standing on the suitcase, pulled out the glass cutter and started to trace the glass cutter onto the window of the museum. Suddenly, he dropped the glass cutter on the ground between the building and the fence, and he was not getting it back. It was at this moment that he had a well, momentarily returning of his conscience, thinking that maybe he shouldn't do this. But he got over that pretty quickly, grabbed a rock and smashed the window right in front of him. 
He used the suitcase to push out the glass and dropped down onto the museum hallway. Edwin said he wasn't sure why he didn't cut himself on the glass, but he was unscathed as he entered the museum. What he didn't know was that he'd set off a silent alarm, but evidently the security guard was caught up in a soccer game, or I don't know, maybe not. There's some disagreement there, but either way, the guard didn't notice, and Edwin was able to run amok in the museum for around an hour. He headed towards the birds. After a few minutes, he was there, the enormous room filled with those large white steel filing cabinets that he was well familiar with, having memorized those photographs that he took. But it was dark, and he only had that little LED light, so he just started opening up and grabbing all the birds he could get his hands on. He filled up his suitcase, a little Tetris game of millions of dollars worth of birds and bird feathers. First, a dozen fruit crows. Next, nearly 40 quetzals, each nearly four feet long. He moved row by row, stuffing his suitcase with bird after bird after bird. Then realizing he had lost track of time, Edwin zipped up his bursting bag and went out the way he came, shoving the suitcase out onto the ground first, and then headed back to the train station. Turns out he had missed the last train to London. So he sat with his million dollar bird bag on the platform until 3.54 a.m. the next day. When Edwin got back to his apartment, he laid out all of his 299 spoils on his bed. Yes, he had stolen just one shy of 300 birds. Either small birds or a big suitcase, if you ask me. And then, almost immediately, Edwin got to work. He knew how valuable these feathers were, and he began selling them in various online fly-tying message boards, and often on eBay using the name Flute Player 1988 as well as his own website, edwinrist.com. Edwin sold individual feathers all the way up to entire bird skins, sometimes making thousands of dollars a pop. If anyone asked where the birds came from, he'd make up a story, but almost no one asked. Don't ask, don't tell. Stolen bird style. At the museum, the broken window was discovered the next morning. The authorities and museum officials pretty quickly determined that nothing had been stolen. Uh, yep, yeah, you heard that right. I guess because they didn't think anyone was interested in the backroom birds. It would take 35 days for the Natural History Museum at Tring to even realize they had been robbed. A full seven days after the closed circuit television cameras reset. Someone wrote to the museum inquiring about one of Alfred's birds, and a curator went to the cabinet, discovering, to his horror, that it was empty. The then science director of the museum, Richard Lane, would say, quote, These birds are extremely scarce. They are scarce in collections and even more scarce in the wild. Our utmost priority is working with the police to return these specimens to the national collections so that they can be used by future generations of scientists, end quote. Authorities were a bit stumped. There was almost no physical evidence. Well, except a visitor's log. <laughs> Little did they know that the person who had committed the crime had actually signed into the visitor's log with his real name. And I mean, who... Like, literally, who does that? So I guess I don't blame them for not investigating that. The birds would get Edwin caught eventually, however, when a few members of the fly-tying community, seeing an influx of rare birds coming from a guy they, well, assumed was born in 1988 and therefore had no feasible way of having so many badass bird feathers, and they actually tipped off authorities to look into this flautist Authorities snagged a warrant and showed up at his apartment on the morning of November 12th, 2010. He immediately confessed and brought police into his bedroom where his girlfriend was sleeping and the remaining 160 bird skins were stored waiting to be sold. How, how on earth did that girlfriend not have any questions? I mean, <laughs> what? Okay. Since he'd confessed, there was no trial, but instead Edwin went straight to the sentencing phase, where he was facing 10 years for burglary and an additional 14 years for selling stolen goods. But his lawyers brought in a psychologist that diagnosed Edwin with autism, and specifically Asperger's syndrome. Yes, I know we don't really use Asperger's syndrome anymore, but this was 10 years ago, and that's what his diagnosis was. 
The judge said that there had been a legal precedent actually set with another case with a defendant who had Asperger's. So if the judge gave Edwin a long sentence, it was likely to be overturned on appeal. So instead, Edwin was given a suspended sentence of 12 months in prison and 12 months of probation. That's suspended, suspended, that means... He was ordered to pay restitution for any money he'd made selling the feathers, at least $125,000, but he didn't spend a single night in jail. Authorities were able to recover the remaining specimens from Edwin's apartment and return them to the Natural History Museum at Tring. Some additional specimens were returned by the people who bought them, and Edwin's father even reimbursed some of the buyers. It amounted to about one-third of them returned in unscathed or similar condition. One third of them returned had been plucked or otherwise damaged. And all two thirds of those specimens had those very crucial signed tags removed. That means that for all intents and purposes, they are now useless for science. One third of the specimens were gone forever. The Natural History Museum at Tring has said that they obviously care about the security and well-being of their collections. As a result of the heist, they changed how they granted access to the collections and increased security. And their moves worked. In 2011, a thief broke through the museum's front doors and stole what they thought were horns from an Indian rhinoceros and a white rhinoceros using a large hammer. Turns out those horns were just resin replicas with no commercial value. Following his sentence, Edwin Rist graduated from the Royal Academy of Music and is currently living his dream of playing the flute in the Berlin Symphony Orchestra under a fake name. He says he doesn't consider himself a thief. Thanks for hanging out with me. Okay, I guess Edwin doesn't consider himself a thief, but I do. This story may be funny or strange, but actually it's like, it's a tragedy, especially for natural history. These are priceless specimens that will never be recovered or have been damaged or are now useless to science. This kid, who I guess is actually basically my age, but he really doesn't think he did anything wrong. It makes me mad. By the way, I'm not the only one who feels this way. And there is a This American Life episode from 2018 where a journalist, he actually investigates and tries to track down the remaining birds to return them to the museum. I won't give away what happens, but I'll be sure to link the episode in the description box. It's a good one. Speaking of the description box, I actually do link all of my sources down there because I'm no plagiarizer. <laughs> If you ever want to do any more research on any of the cases, um, that's a good place to start. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to stealing 300 priceless bird skins, fly tire or not.